welcome to this short presentation on how to give your puppy the best start. Now I was given a very, very rough brief, um, basically told that I had to fill 20 minutes and that was it. <laughs> so I hope that this will actually give you a bit of useful information. Um, I'm actually here on behalf of Royal Canin, but I'm not going to talk about our products at all. That's not the point of the presentation. It's literally to give you some general information and to help you make the right choice. So, if you thought about what gives your puppy the best start in life, I mean, let's be honest, we want to give them the best start because they're going to end up being our best friend. So we've got to think long and hard about what decisions we're actually making. Now, regardless of the size of puppy, or breed of puppy, or where you got that puppy from, there's really three key things you have to consider when discussing their diet. The first of these is looking to have sufficient energy within the diet. We want to make sure we're giving them enough to achieve their optimum growth. We also want to make sure they've got enough nutrition. Calories alone are not enough. So we've got to look to proteins, vitamins, and minerals as well. The second thing that we need from a good puppy diet is to make sure that it's highly digestible. We've got to take into account that puppies are still growing and developing, and when we get them at eight to 10 weeks of age, they're very fragile and very delicate, and we must give them the best possible start and the most help we can. The last point that's worth considering is actually how we can help develop those natural defenses. The immune system is a concept that is very difficult to explain and you, you can't see the benefits. So for us, it's really important that from a nutritional point of view, you help to do the best you can. If... <laughs> Sorry, I was being waved up from the back. If we look at the ideal growth of the puppy, you can see that what really impacts is the end size of the dog. So whether you're buying a Yorkshire Terrier or a Great Dane, that really makes a difference as to what you need to feed your puppy. Even when they're born, it has a huge impact on their end result. I mean, puppies' birth weights vary from 70 grams to 700 grams, and they can reach an end body weight of anything between two kilos and 70 kilos. So they're a species with one of the biggest areas of variation. Now for a mini dog, we aim to have them at full adult potential at around nine or 10 months of age. And that means that their growth is very rapid, very intense, and that they need a lot of support in a short space of time. Medium breeds, it takes a little bit longer, around a year for them to reach adult maturity. And so again, still plenty of energy and nutrition, but we've got a little bit longer. We'll get to it really begins to change with your maxi and giant breeds, where their growth and development takes significantly longer time. It's really important for these dogs that we have a very steady, very slow and controlled growth rate. They're far more at risk of having excess weight gain or joint issues from growing too quickly. And for the giants, it can take up to two years for a giant puppy to be fully grown. So it's very, very long and delicate process and you can't rush it. People quite often have this thing with, particularly with your larger breeds, that they must get them to their adult potential as quickly mm -hmm. as possible. That's not actually the ideal. Taking the time and giving the puppy the most support will get them there in a much healthier way. Whether they reach adult weight at six months or two years, it won't change their adult potential. So what does a dog need nutritionally to grow to its best potential? Well, firstly, it's got to be down to energy. The amount of calories within the diet greatly impact. We also have to look at the level of proteins, but also the muscles and the development of the skeleton. If we look at energy levels first, this is usually where people get most confused. They tend to feel that protein impacts on a dog's energy levels and that having a high protein diet, particularly for a puppy, can increase that puppy's risk of becoming hyperactive. In fact, the calories for a puppy come from the fat within the diet. And as you can see, fats provide twice as many calories as either carbohydrate or protein. What's particularly important when you're developing your puppy diet is to actually understand how many calories you're feeding. 
People are usually quite surprised when I say, it actually doesn't matter how many calories are in the bag. What really does matter though, is how many calories actually go into the puppy. For example, if we take our two products, we've got Puppy Food A has 3,000 kilocalories in it. The feeding guideline says that for our puppy, we should feed 150 grams a day. That gives our puppy 450 kilocalories. Compare that to Puppy Food B. It starts off being a much higher calorie diet, but it's also got a much lower feeding guideline. So the puppy will still be set the same number of calories. It's very important when feeding growth products that you do follow the feeding guideline. It is there for a reason, and although there will be slight differences with individuals, it will give you a very good ballpark figure. When I'm actually working out and about, particularly at shows and events, the most common question that I'm asked is, how do you work out the feeding guideline? because every manufacturer uses a slightly different method, a slightly different table, and it can actually be very, very confusing. When it comes to a puppy even more so, the most important thing when looking at the feeding guideline is to work out whether it's based on the expected adult body weight of the dog, or whether they're actually using the current weight of the puppy. Yes, so, for us, we actually base it on the adult body weight. The reason being that it gives a very long and steady growth rate. For example, if you have a puppy that's maybe a little bit overweight or a little bit underweight, by the time it's got to its expected adult body weight, we will have ironed out those kinks. Whereas if you're feeding, judging by the puppy's weight currently, you will continue to have an either slightly overweight or underweight puppy. And that's not really the ideal. The second thing that's important to do is make sure you know how old your puppy is. Now, I know that sounds silly, but the amount of people who don't actually change the puppy's feeding amount as they grow is quite astonishing. So always adapt and adapt things slowly. Once you know your daily amount on the feeding guide, you need to remember to divide that into different meal times. Almost every food will give you an amount for a 24 hour period but for a growing and developing puppy, they cannot tolerate one single large meal. It's really important to them to have split feeding, usually for about three or four meals a day, up until about five or six months of age. Even after that point, we still recommend feeding at least two meals a day, because it's much safer and much easier for them to digest things if it's not all in one go. It's particularly important when you're feeding your young puppy that you set a routine. It's something that sounds very simple, but just as you would with a child, make sure they have set meal times. Give them maybe 20, 30 minutes to eat their meal, and anything that's left over, remove from the situation. That has two benefits. Firstly, if you leave food down all the time, you do run the risk of the dog becoming fussy because it always expects food to be available, so it doesn't really think about eating. Whereas if it has set meal times, it knows that that is the time to eat and that it will get all of its nutrition. The other issue with leading food down, especially if you've got puppies and if you're soaking the food or making it softer, is that you'll have the risk of the food going off. You'll lose important nutrients, important vitamins, but also you increase the risk of having an upset tummy. So the best possible thing is to actually pick the food up regularly after eating. It's also absolutely essential that you always have clean, fresh water alongside any food, whether it's a dry diet or a wet food. One of the most important things with puppies is avoiding an excess calorie intake. Within our society today, we look after our pets very well. And actually, the more common health problems are to do with nutritional excess rather than nutritional deficiency. Puppies, by their very nature, are always going to be greedy eaters. If the food is there, they will scavenge it. And particularly for some breeds, typical Labrador or Beagle, that's even more the case. So if you're not sure how much to feed, always slightly underfeed and then adapt it to your individual puppy. 
A puppy that's underweight during its growth is more likely to be overweight for the rest of its lifetime and that can lead to a very much increased risk from diseases such as diabetes, skin and coat disease and mainly joint disease. So it's very, very important not to have the old-fashioned butterball puppies. Moving on to the developing of the skeleton. Now the first thing we always think about when we're talking about bones is calcium and phosphorus. We talk about minerals. People tend to forget the fact that although minerals make up two-thirds of the skeleton, actually a third is also made up of protein. So ensuring there's good quality protein within the diet is essentially important. When it comes to our minerals, feeding a complete commercial diet is the best and easiest way to go. I know that some people feel that they would like to supplement more, but actually that's often more harm than good. And any good quality commercial diet will be fully complete with minerals. When we say don't supplement, it is for a very good reason. Adult dogs can actually regulate the way they take minerals into their body. So they can select what they need from their diet and use it, and anything that they don't need will actually be excreted. Puppies don't have that ability. It's like having an open door. Anything that you put into the diet will be taken into the puppy, and that can cause serious problems within their joints. So it's best not to do it. Finally, when it comes to building their body, the initial growth is always on the skeleton. The bones always grow first. But after this, we lay down the muscles and the body condition. Now for this again, we need lots of good quality protein to build healthy, strong muscles, but we also need to look at the development of the other organs, particularly, for example, the brain, the vision, and the nervous system. When it comes to nutrition, actually there's been a lot of research over the last few years into some of the more trace elements of nutrition. The one that's come to light most recently, and has probably been most in the press, is the inclusion of fish oil within puppy foods. EPA and DHA are two very important nutrients that are only found in very few ingredients, fish oil being one of them. And there's been many studies taken that actually show that having a diet which contains fish oil will actually lead to a smarter and more trainable puppy. I'm not convinced it worked in my Labrador, but we can't quite tell. <laughs> Again, most good quality pet foods will actually contain this already. So it's always better to go for a food where it's included, rather than trying to supplement for yourself. So, just to review, what do we need to have the best possible growth? We need to actually feed to the expected lifestyle and life stage of the animal. So if you've got a mini dog, we want to feed for a short rapid growth, a medium dog, a slightly more moderate growth, and a maxi and giant dog, we want to give them a slow, steady, controlled growth. We want to look for a puppy food that has a good level of quality protein, something around the ballpark of 30%. And we also want to make sure that we're feeding the best we possibly can, preferably a complete commercial diet so that we don't have to supplement and we can be really confident that everything that puppy needs is already within the food. Now the second point that we need to look at when it comes to feeding your first puppy is actually looking at digestive safety. Now this covers a whole host of things, right from palatability initially, through to the digestibility of the ingredients and the actual end result. Palatability in dogs is quite a complex situation. It's very, very different from what we think of. For us, if we go out for dinner, it's very important that the food looks as we would want it. We like things to be the right colour, and we like the right things to go together, and we like it all to be displayed very nicely. Dogs, they don't care. We could feed them something that was purple with pink spots, and it wouldn't make the blind bit of difference to them. What they're looking for is a diet that smells good. It has to be really aromatic. And what's more important is actually the way it feels in the mouth when they're eating it. They like something that they can actually crunch on and something that makes them feel good, feel satisfied after eating. Smell is particularly important for dogs and it's well worth remembering that actually your mini dogs are fussier because they have a weaker sense of smell. We do tend to blame the owners for giving in to them and treating them and cuddling them, but actually, biologically, they do have a slightly weaker sense of smell, so there is a good reason for it. 
What's particularly important with dogs is that they, like us, have a social implication about eating. Whereas we like it to be social, if we go around and have a cup of coffee with a friend, we usually break out the chocolate cake as well. For dogs, it's a social implication, but they don't want to share. And that's why they're very greedy eaters. If you've got dogs eating nearby, it, they will compete to see who can finish their bowl first. So it's very important that you'll give your puppy peace and quiet, that he doesn't feel threatened when he's eating, so that he can slow down and actually eat in a way that's much healthier for him. Food that's gulped down has no be dental benefits. It's not going to be good for the tummy. And usually, they'll end up being sick afterwards. So remove the threat, remove other dogs, and give them a nice, calm, quiet environment in which to eat their food. Dogs, again, unlike us, don't appreciate change. Okay? Whereas we like to have a different meal every night, and certainly my other half gets very sulky if I expect him to eat yesterday's leftovers for the second day in a row. But for dogs, they like that routine. They like to know what they're eating and have the same thing every day. They don't have a concept of flavour in the way that we do. It's really not important to them. So for the sake of a healthy digestion, you're much better finding a food they like and that suits them and then sticking with it. One thing that is worth remembering about our little puppies is that they do have incredibly small stomachs. Okay. Just because they think they can eat the entire bag doesn't mean that they can or they should. Puppies are greedy, so it's up to us to regulate their food intake and to make sure they are having these small and frequent meals. It's also down to us what treats we feed them. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you not to give your dogs treats, because we all do it. But I'm just saying, be sensible about what you use for a treat and be sensible how many they have. Ideally, they should have no more than 10% of their daily calories from treats. After this, it starts to impact on the quality of their diet. It's also well worth considering when you are giving treats, trying to give something that doesn't contain lots of colorants and additives. Try and stick to something that's reasonably healthy. And again, preferably not human food, because you're creating a taste for something that really isn't always good for them. The other point of note is feed the best that you can afford. It sounds fairly common sense, but what can seem like economy in the first place is not always ideal for the long run. Now, there's a whole range of dog foods out there on the commercial market, from the very low cost to the very high cost. But it's worth taking into account that it's not necessarily the cost of the bag, but how long that bag will last that should be taken into account when choosing your food. It's also worth noting that actually how much of that food is being used by the puppy and how much is being wasted and going out into the stools. We all want to be responsible dog owners, so having a food that's mainly digested by the dog with very little waste is going to be a huge benefit, both for them, but also for us. Look for the most digestible of ingredients. So we want to look for proteins such as soy, fish, chicken, for carbohydrates such as rice and maize. What we don't want to find is dogs that are, dog foods that are full of colorants. Okay? If you open your dog food and it looks like Smarties, it's probably not the best thing to be feeding. It's always worth considering whether your food gives you any added value. Okay? Any commercial diet will meet the basic needs. But there are diets out there that can give you a lot of added extras. Nutrients such as prebiotics are a real benefit to your growing puppy. They will help to protect the gut and also the natural defences, helping the puppy to build its own supply of good bacteria, improving digestion. It is worth noting that diarrhoea in puppies is unfortunately very common. There is a whole host of reasons why it can happen. For example, stress if they've newly moved, overfeeding the treats, maybe changing their diet too quickly from one to another. But if your puppy starts to lose weight or loses condition in any way, then do get them checked by a vet. I did also want to mention, although it's not directly related to feeding, that worming your puppy is incredibly important throughout its growth period. 
not only will that impact on the digestion process, but also for the health of you and your family. There are worms in dogs that can be passed on to humans, particularly children who are not as good at washing their hands and thinking about what they're doing. So worming regularly throughout the puppy's lifetime is going to be a really important health benefit. So at the end result, what we're looking for? Well, we're looking for small, easy to pick up stools, preferably ones that are low order and where the puppy doesn't suffer from excess flatulence. And that's really the best indication you can have that you are feeding the right food for your dog and that also you're feeding the right amount. If your stools are slightly soft, it's a key indication that you are overfeeding your puppy. The last point I wanted to bring up when it comes to the dietary requirements of your growing puppy is actually how diet can help support the developing natural defences. Believe it or not, it's very stressful being a puppy. You get picked up from your nice, safe, comfortable home where you know all your brothers and sisters and your parents, and suddenly you're taken to, quite often, a chaotic madhouse where you're introduced to children, cats, neighbours, friends, puppy parties, the vets, and it's a very stressful situation. Add to that, you might have a change in diet, new walks, and be unable to sleep because you're not sure where you are. And this starts the same by having a weakened natural defence. You've also got to take into account that this co coincides with the immunity gap. All puppies who have been fed by the mother will have inherited immunity. It comes through the antibodies within the milk. But over time, this immunity actually fades away. And so by around the fourth week, the puppy has very little immunity to rely on. As the puppy develops and grows, it will start to build its own natural defences, but this takes a while, and so it's not usually until around the 12th week that the puppy's own natural defences are fully formed. So at the same period as it's moving house, learning new things and changing its diet, it's also in this weakened state. And that's why it's particularly important that we give as much support as we can throughout the diet. When you're looking to support the natural defences, there's a few key things that you should be looking for within the diet. Particularly, a nice high levels of vitamins, particularly vitamin C and vitamin D. You can be looking for pigments such as lutein and beta-carotene, and other nutrients such as taurine are all really beneficial. Polyphenols are sometimes mentioned, and they're a very powerful source of antioxidants. All of these have a real beneficial effect throughout the puppy's lifetime. Now, I hope that in that 20 minutes, I've at least given you some useful information. And if you have any questions, I'll be very pleased to take them. Okay, have I done a good job? Are you all stunned into silence? <laughs> Either that, or you're obviously too scared to ask in front of everybody else. In which case, I'm working on the Royal Cannon stand for the whole weekend. Feel free to come and chat if you want to.